tēnā koutou katoa, ki nga iwi, kaitahu, ka te māmoi, waitaha, me nga haku katoa, i mihi nunui ki a koutou katoa. Tēnā ki te mihi ki te whare, i tūnei, tēnā koutou katoa. Nga maua ko tōku tuakana a James, nga kaiārahi takirua hau, o te rōpū kākāreki, no mai ki tēnei hui i tēnei pō. Kia ora koutou katoa. I just want to acknowledge the iwi of this place and all the hapū of this land. Kaitahu, Kati Māmoi, Waitaha and all of their hapū. And this place, this whare, is a really, you know, they're doing a lot of great work done out of this whare. It's all filled with that, you know, that vibe of many years of people working for justice and for peace. Um, and for sustainability. And on behalf of my brother James, um, the new co-leader team of the Green Party of Aotearoa, I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight um, to talk with us about, about our vision for Christchurch, about your vision, more importantly, for Christchurch. Um, I'm going to hand it over in a moment to James, and he's going to speak to you first, um, and then I'll follow up on some of the issues that I've been working on on inequality. Um, and then it would be really great to hear the all to talk with you, um, not just answer questions, but to have a conversation with you about what your vision for Christchurch is and how you want us to support that vision. So I'm looking forward to that. So I want to acknowledge uh, Eugenie Sage, a Green Party MP, and who was responsible for the Christchurch revamp, and newly um, in the caucus revamp of portfolios now has both environment and primary industries, um, a very major portfolio area in both economics and the environment. So I'm um, really pleased that, that Eugenia is here with us tonight too. And she may well be able to answer lots of your questions if James and I can't. So, Kilda, thank you. Just a quick check. Can everybody hear clearly? Can you hear at the back of the hall? We'll use the microphone later so that people asking questions can be heard clearly throughout the hall. Enga mana, enga reo, uh, enga iwi o te motu, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. He mihi nui kia koutou. Good evening. Uh, my name is James Shaw. I am of late uh, the other co-leader of the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand. It's uh, a real privilege uh, to be here tonight and to talk with you all. So, Materia and I decided shortly after the uh, co-leader election that we would do a, a tour of New Zealand, um, which isn't quite a tour and that it's not a sort of a continuous uh, event, but because um, we have to be in Parliament um, arguing about legislation and so on every now and then, um, but we are uh, going to be visiting you know, towns and cities around the country over the course of the next few months, uh, and Christchurch is our first full stop along the way. Can I just do a quick check? Who here is already a Green Party member? Okay. Um, <laughs> just wanted to check how... Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, the, the balance of things. For those of you who are not, um, thank you very uh, much for coming out tonight. So I thought, I, for, for the benefit of those of you who don't know me already, and I acknowledge that you know I've got a number of long-time friends in the room, but for those of you who I haven't met before, I, I, I would start with a little bit about myself, uh, recognizing that you know for the most part people don't know me from a bar of soap, um, and then uh, talk a bit more about uh, Christchurch and uh, climate change, which is one of my major portfolio areas. Uh, and how those two things kind of come together in, uh, in our view. So, good evening. Kilda. Welcome. So I was born and raised in Wellington. I'm a Wellingtonian. Uh, and I uh, went to Wellington High School and Victoria University and then essentially spent my career based out of London, uh, working primarily in the field of sustainable development and the business world. So trying to be in, kind of inside the institution of business, helping businesses to become, I keep saying sustainable, but actually the truth is less unsustainable, right? <laughs> to get, to sort of try and nudge us along that path uh, where we, at the very least, do less harm while we go about, uh, go about our business. And what I noticed uh, in the work that I was doing was that I, um, I, I basically had four categories of organization uh, that I was working with. So one category were businesses where at the executive or the board level, 
um, there was a real commitment to the notion of sustainable development, and they had money to invest, and that was like they were, you know, on that, and they, they decided that's where they were going. And they wanted to achieve those things. Then there was a category of business where, you know, there were some people in maybe middle management who were really committed to the idea of sustainable development, but the people at the weren't, top weren't, and the people in the middle were kind of banging their heads against a brick wall and not getting very far. And then the third category uh, of company, which unfortunately was the more frequent one that I encountered, were companies that thought, this is a really great marketing opportunity, but they didn't really need to do anything particularly different. Uh, and then the fourth category were companies that actually just didn't care. And what I noticed during the years that I was working with them uh, was that the companies that had the commitment at the level of the executive or the board and had money to invest weren't making the investments that they wanted to make to make their businesses into sustainable businesses because they were competing with companies that weren't willing to make those investments. Uh, and in the shareholder-driven world that we've got, where you know, we're trying to extract, particularly pension funds, trying to extract as much money as fast as possible out of you know, publicly traded companies, the shorter-term investments were the ones that got rewarded. And so businesses that wanted to make longer, because generally if you're trying to you know, shift your business to be a more sustainable company, you're talking longer time horizons, longer investments. You've got to spend the money and then, and then it'll get returned to you a bit later on. So those ones, they, they were actually withheld from, uh, from making them. And the thought occurred to me, some of the world's largest economic institutions, big global companies with a ton of money, are actually operating inside the same set of conditions that you and I are operating in. So I know, you know, there's that, uh, you know, the song, It's Not Easy Being Green. Um, it, we know that as individuals, if you want to live a truly sustainable lifestyle, like a truly sustainable lifestyle where you have nil impact on kind of the air, the water, the, you know, land, seas, and so on and so forth, that's actually quite hard. It's quite a hard proposition. If you want to put up a, a small windmill on your, on, your, um, on your roof and generate your own power, you know that the batteries and the sorry the um, the magnets that 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 are in in those um, in those turbines, the manufacturing process uh, you know, kind of further up the line is a pretty filthy one, unfortunately. So even if you're talking clean energy, actually uh, there's quite a lot of dirt that gets displaced in, in order to get to that point. It's just not easy being green. And so what's true of us as individuals is also true of us as families, uh, as cities, as countries, and as businesses. And so the thought occurred to me that um, if that's going to change, uh, then you've got to change those conditions and that the place to do that is in the world of politics, right? Because ultimately what we're talking about here is what are the taxation, the incentives, the regulations that shape the way that, uh, that you know, businesses can behave? How do we tilt the balance in favour of organisations that want to do the right thing? Uh, rather than the current set of conditions that have tipped the balance in the favour of the ones that kind of don't really care or aren't willing to make those investments. And so, um, you know, that I, I was sort of having those thoughts in the mid-2000s and ultimately that brought me back here uh, to, uh, to New Zealand in 2010. And I stood for Parliament in Wellington Central in 2011 and then again last year uh, when I was uh, elected to Parliament and became the new guy. Um, which didn't last long, uh, as it turns out. So, I think, one of the things that really appalled me when I came back to New Zealand, there are a number of things. Um, it was great coming home, great having a, a, you know, the brilliant lifestyle that we've got here in New Zealand, because it, it beats the lifestyle in most other places in the world. But one of the things that really appalled me is that we are so far behind. So far behind. And... You know, there are things going on in other parts of the world where, uh, you know, companies doing extraordinary things and taking advantage of, uh, you know, the opportunity to innovate and to move into these great new uh, kind of fields, using sustainability as the edge for innovation, right? So one of the stories I tell is about a carpet manufacturing company called Interface, uh, who are a, a, a billion-dollar manufacturer of petroleum nylon carpet tiles, or at least they used to make petroleum nylon carpet uh, tiles. Over the course of the last 20 years, they've managed to disinvest and then reinvest, so now half of their raw product is from biological materials, wood, wool, uh, and so on and so forth, and their intention is to use no finite resources by the year 2020, so they've only got a few years left. 
their carbon emissions have fallen 74%, right? So when the government says that, you know, 11% is a challenging figure, I laugh. <laughs> and not in a funny way. Um, their, uh, their, um, uh, I think, what is it there? I think their, their, their use of, um, oh, their landfill, uh, waste to landfill has fallen 94%. Uh, and at the same time, They've sold, you know, they've gone from a two hundred million dollar company to a billion dollar company, and, and they're making tons of profit. And part of it is because the innovation that they've had, you know, they took on this vision. They said, "We want to be the world's first fully sustainable commercial enterprise anywhere in the world, and to show the world how it's done." And we just happened to make carpet. Uh, and what happened was, is that as they started to innovate and become, you know, to move towards becoming the world's most sustainable company, uh, they all of these other businesses that wanted carpet came to them um, because they wanted sustainable carpet, you know, they, and so on. So it really drove their, drove their business. They didn't start the mission because they wanted to make more profit or to get larger. They started it because they wanted, you know, they had this vision of being this fully sustainable enterprise and showing the world what it takes. And then the other things followed. They'd done some extraordinary things. They, um, <coughs> They built a factory in China in which the water that's coming out of the outflow pipes is cleaner than the water that goes into the inflow pipes on the river. Now in China that's not hard, um, <laughs> you just need to boil it for a bit, but the point is, is that they, they got their engineers to design a factory deliberately to scrub the river that they were, that they were working with, to clean the river that they were working with. Uh, the, w the waste to landfill, you know, when, apparently, when you make carpet, uh, you know, you get lots of little offcuts. And they used to throw thousands of tons of offcuts uh, into landfill because they don't, you know, they're, they're not they're not nice squares, right? They're not terribly useful. So they got their designers to work out t tiles that used offcuts. So you get these kind of funky, multicolored geographic shapes just using offcuts. Uh, so they've got, you know, virtually no landfill waste anymore. Um, they they've gone from using no renewable energy in their factories to something like 35% of their of their power is is done on site using renewable, you know, sun and wind and so on, micro hydro in some places. And the really interesting thing is that they stopped selling carpet. They lease it. So interesting thing about it, them, a lot of their clients are commercial clients, right? So you lay down these big, you know, you get an office, you lay down the carpet, and then over time the carpet near the window fades or around the door it gets a little kind of worn through and then what happens is you come along you rip up the entire carpet and you know you throw it into landfill and then you get a new carpet right that's generally how it rolls apparently um, so what they did is with the tiles they said well we'll just take away the bits that are faded or the bits that are worn and replace them with, with new ones right so that way we don't need to do the whole thing but the carpet that you no longer need because we're leasing it to you we still own it so when you don't need it, we take it back and it goes back into the factory and makes new carpet. So it becomes fully recycled. It's an extraordinary vision, right? And they're doing incredibly well out of it. And so, you know, I, I think that New Zealand has the opportunity to be the world's first fully sustainable economy and to show the world how, you know, how, what it takes to do that. We have tremendous, we've, we're wealthier in renewable resources than we are in finite resources. You know, we're already at the point where 75% of our electricity is generated from renewable sources. It's actually not hard for us to close the, close the gap. So one of the things that I, I, I was a little shocked by when I got back was um, our kind of lack of vision around that and how far behind we are. And this brings me to Christchurch. Because Christchurch, I think, uh, represents the greatest opportunity um, that we have to innovate around these kinds of things. So Christchurch is the city that gets to show the rest of the country how it's done. Right? It's, it, can be our, uh, it can be our kind of laboratory, our workshop, our, the garage where we, uh, where we do these things. I was, you know, I said I was, I'm a Wellingtonian, right? And I'm a, I'm a patriotic Wellingtonian. And I read the, um, what was it called? The Share, Share Your Idea, uh, the plan that came out of the end result of that. An amazing, extraordinary document. Uh, generated by the people of Christchurch in this massive, brilliant participa you know, participatory process. And I read that document uh, in, in 2011. I, you know, I was looking at the... Uh, we were in the middle of an election campaign. I remember reading that document and thinking, man, if Christchurch does that, Wellington is screwed. <laughs> right? Because this will be the most amazing city 
uh, in the country and by extension the world uh, you know to, to live in and that'll attract talent and it'll attract businesses and it'll be just it'll be fantastic and it's been I think incredibly unfortunate uh, that what has happened is that that document hasn't been given kind of the life that it, it deserves um, because it is an extraordinary vision and in particular this is where I come over sounding a little bit like the Tea Party. The thing that is standing in the way is the government, right? It's not Christchurch. It's not the people of Christchurch. It's not the city council of Christchurch. It's not the organizations in Christchurch. It's the central government in, uh, in Wellington. And it's yeah. kind of fascinating. When, when you look at, when you walk around Christchurch and you look at the areas where there are development, you know, that things are kind of getting restored uh, and coming back to life, and areas that are still basically car parks, uh, the areas that are still basically car parks are the ones that the government is directly responsible for. And to me that's shocking. So I, I think it, you know, what, you know, one of the th reasons why Eugenie in particular and the Greens have been talking a lot about local democracy is as a way of ensuring that, the, that, um, that people in Christchurch are actually able to breathe life into that vision and to take control uh, of your own destiny again. And I know that you know, there's a lot going on in that, in that area right now. Um, so, in terms of climate change, uh, th th this is one of my portfolio areas. I have two, economic development and, uh, and climate change. And to me, those things are inextricably linked. Right? So, we tend to think of them as, as separate things. But I think if we're going to create the sustainable economy, then our, you know, the government has this business growth agenda. Uh, and I kind of think, well, what is the green version of that? What's the green business agenda that's going to get us to that, uh, to that sustainable economy. Uh, to have low carbon businesses, you know, high tech, high value, innovative, you know, smart uh, organisations. And a lot of the leading work around that is going on here in Christchurch. And in relation to climate change, there, you've actually got a, a real life lab. I mean, I know that the crisis here was the earthquakes, but it simulates and a lot of the consequences simulate a lot of what New Zealand is going to go through, a lot of the rest of the world is going to go through over the coming decades uh, as you know, sea levels rise and we see more extreme weather events, more frequent, longer, deeper droughts, uh, more f uh, frequent, stronger storms, uh, flood events, uh, and so on. And I know, um, you know here in Christchurch, you, you know, some land went up and some land went down to the point that you've got areas of Christchurch that effectively saw the equivalent of a half metre sea level rise. And you're dealing with some of the consequences of that in engineering terms and town planning terms and property and, and so on. And, uh, you know, to me, we should be treating that like, I mean, we should be, you know, fixing that, but really learning from it because, you know, most people in New Zealand live close to the sea. And so most people in New Zealand, over the course of the coming few decades, are going to be dealing with exactly... Uh, these kinds of challenges and ha how we how we deal about that. Who here watches The Simpsons? <laughs> okay. Perfectly <laughs> legitimate. <laughs> this joke may not land. <laughs> there's a scene, there's a scene in, in a in a Simpsons episode where uh, somebody I can't I can't remember one of the characters says uh, you know the Chinese have a single word for crisis and opportunity. And Simpson goes, yeah, Christ-a-tunity. <laughs> and actually, it's a word we've adopted at Parliament. It's a Christ-a-tunity. Um, is, that, is, that that's what, is that what you have here in, uh, in Christchurch, is an opportunity to, uh, to, you know, through the innovation and the responses, civic-led, you know, ground up, um, to, to actually demonstrate not just kind of to regenerate Christchurch, but actually to model for the whole country uh, how we can do things, what that alternative economy looks like, you know, how do you, how do we get from uh, from here to there, in a managed way, not you know, not in response to like a you know particular flood event or anything like that, you know, and I know that there are, I mean, there's already something like six thousand houses uh, in you know sort of close to the shoreline here that are going to be dealing with, in fact, are already facing the possibility that there may have to be a managed retreat from the shoreline. Eighteen thousand houses here that live in a, um, you know, kind of a high-risk flood uh, zone. And so how do we deal with that? And, like, that's not great news for the people who live in those, uh, in those places. Um, and how we respond to that, I think, is where we get to see how good we are uh, at this kind of thing. 
And so far, the government's record hasn't been great. So um, that was that's kind of you know where I'm coming from, saying this is this is where we want to work with uh, the people of Christchurch because there is amazing stuff going on here. And um, Materia and I have spent most of the day meeting with you know um, councillors and the media and you know the student volunteer army and you know kind of various um, like a, a ton of um, different organisations uh, at the. Um, the community house, yeah, thank you. 20, 20 something different organisations there. Working in a shared space that's set up in a, in a way to <coughs> collaborate with each other rather than to separate. A lot of the best work in the country is happening here right now. Um, and so, uh, to me, that's a great thing. Obviously, not a great reason to have done it, but uh, stuff that you can show to the rest of the country. So, it's been a great opportunity for us to, uh, to be here. And we didn't even scratch the surface. So we're going to have to come back, which I'm really looking forward to. So thank you. Thank you for having us. And I'll turn it over to um, Materia now. For the rest of the you. My areas of responsibility in our caucus are inequality and uh, building and housing. This is my new portfolio after um, the reshuffle. And uh, Māori affairs. So those are the three areas that I do most of my work in. And inequality and climate change are the two priorities of the Green Party caucus. Um, they are our two major campaigns, and particularly in climate change, focused on uh, the COP um, in Paris, the conference in Paris, and getting to a decent target, and we've seen some of that work. Um, just while I'm remembering, because I forgot before, we also have a worth saving campaign. I'll talk to you about inequality stuff in a minute. You can wave it around here. Go. <laughs> this is our. This is um, one of our engagements for <laughs> James is Mother. <laughs> James is Mother. Yeah, our um, our we're saving. So if you want to come and uh, we've got some chalk, I think somewhere, and uh, you can write down what you think is we're saving. And this is part of our public engagement. We're getting just hundreds and hundreds of photos of people saying what they believe is worth saving and therefore why um, it's important to take real action on climate change um, and uh, a proper target that makes us proud as a country um, and not cringe as a country. But my work is in inequality and you know we know we live in this incredibly wealthy country. We have access to an amazing natural resource here that is the envy of the world over. Um, I went to Saudi, I went to, not Saudi Arabia, I went to um, the UAE once uh, for a work trip and met with people there who were saying, we'll give you oil if you give us grass. I mean, you know, it was that desperate. They have, they have, uh, um, they have uh, grass areas that are, they have high level protected status over there. Like where you can't, you know, there is protected here, there is one of our most precious environments are protected here. We know that, you know, the world over, we have incredible <coughs> access to natural resources, to fisheries, to land, um, to fresh water. And that's our economy is built on those resources. And that there is enough in this country for it to be shared fairly with everyone. And yet, we all also know that we have an incredibly high rate of child poverty. You know, since National took government, we've 35,000 more children suffer severe poverty now than did, which means around 200,000 children are living in what's technically known as <coughs> severe poverty. Um, that is, on incomes less than 50% of the median wage. Uh, we know that children, as a result, are suffering from worse and worse illnesses as a result of their poverty, whether it's poor health. You would have seen the, um, these terrible scenes of that, uh, of kids with really poor teeth as a result of poor diets, poor diets being driven by a lack of information and a lack of adequate um, resources, income. Uh, we know that more and more children are suffering from respiratory illnesses and that in, in cases, more cases than we know about, children are dying as a result of those respiratory illnesses. So you would have heard of the Emily de Bourne case. Where last year, a baby, she was less than two years old, died of um, complications from a respiratory illness, and where the coroner, for the first time in, in, in the New Zealand history, as far as I'm aware, certainly in the 13 years I've been in Parliament, where the coroner explicitly said 
that it was related to the poor conditions, the damp, cold house, state house that she was living in. And then, of course, the second case is Mr. Tovall, 35 years old, with six children, a working man in a state house, who also died from uh, complications related to a cold, damp house, leaving his family without him to have to survive on their own. So we live in a country with this significant, this huge resource and this huge capacity, and yet still these stories and stories and stories of families doing it extremely hard and children and families suffering as a result. And one of the, as a, you know, we, we are always looking at new policy, new ideas to make things better, and I'm going to talk about some of that shortly. But we also know as a caucus and as members of parliament that we are sometimes quite divorced from what's really going on. So the Green Party MPs have been on a, a fair share tour around the country, and we've been working with community organisations, uh, large and small, and with the people themselves who are affected by you know, the poor lack of income, um, winds, disabilities, mental health issues, um, housing issues, and asking them, what is your understanding about inequality? What does it look like in your community? How is it affecting you and your community? And more importantly, what are the solutions that you think need to be put in place? What are your ideas for making your community work better for you? Uh, because we simply can't assume that just because we're in Parliament and we talk about this stuff all the time that we necessarily have all the ideas. And if we are, as, um, as we like, we, we are proud in the Greens that we are a party that is, um, that is committed to community decision making. And you would have seen that in the work that Eugenie does here in Christchurch really focused on the um, locally led rebuild, on, making, on restoring democracy here in Christchurch, on making sure that the people of Christchurch's voices are heard in the decisions and fighting and fighting and fighting, as she does, uh, to elevate um, the role of the community in making the decisions about what happens here. So it is in a different but nonetheless similar way around the country. Communities know what their problems are, they also know what their solutions are, and we need to be open to hearing those. We have done um, the, um, the fair share tour here in Christchurch. Eugenia, you were at something, you've, you've done a few here. Um, and so, so many of the things that have come out of Christchurch have been repeated around the country, and I think it's important to kind of reiterate some of those things. Over and over again we're hearing that there are too many rental homes that cost too much, are too cold and too damp for safe living. Uh, we've heard over and over again in Christchurch and elsewhere that people simply don't have enough money, that poverty really is an issue of income, that money matters. If you don't have enough money to pay for the basics, you simply can't provide them, no matter what else other interventions people are trying to put in place. Um, so, but in Christchurch in particular, it has been the state of and the cost of housing here. Um, and in Canterbury, it has been a much bigger problem than in many other areas of the country. Auckland is often the one that's talked about, but I think Christchurch is hidden often, or kind of uh, deep downplayed. The issues in Christchurch are often downplayed in all of the talk around um, what's happening in Auckland. Uh, rents are still too high here, and there was a strong call after the earthquakes for rent control. Um, that didn't happen, and you know. One of the problems has meant then that the massive increase in rents that happened post earthquake are now still are still there. So although there may be more houses coming on board um, and there are more houses being built, it doesn't mean that rents are coming down to any kind of reasonable level because of the big jump that was made. So people in Christchurch are still suffering from from unjustifiably high rents, despite the fact that there is an increase in the number of houses. Um, EQC repairs are taking far too long. I mean, you know, you know this. Bit much, much better than I do. But these are the things that we've been hearing. Um, and that so many houses are still unlivable, still can't be safely lived in. Um, so we have here, like elsewhere, but more acutely in Christchurch, all the stories about people living in trailers, living in garages, um, some living in cars, um, the constant demand for emergency housing. So we know that housing is a major issue in this country, and particularly in Christchurch different kind of issue in Auckland, um, but even elsewhere where I live, for example, in Dunedin, it is a major issue in terms of the quality of housing. And so that's why, as the person who's now responsible for our housing policy, 
my focus has been on uh, the first round of, um, of this focus for this winter, because you're going into your fifth winter, hey, since the earthquake, yeah, is around the, the um, warm dry homes um, and uh, presenting um, policy and options that could improve housing, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but also focusing on what's become known as generation rent. You know, the generation of New Zealanders for whom home ownership really is like either many years away than might have been the case for their parents or simply not within their purview. And therefore, how are we protecting people who are likely to be tenants for many more years than their parents were expected to be tenants? And so we're doing work on protecting tenants' rights in terms of secure tenure. We're writing legislation at the moment that will um, provide better security of tenure, like getting rid of leasing fees for tenants, for example, um, uh, reducing the ability for landlords to be able to throw people out, um, or at least increasing the notice that they have to give. So I'd be interested in any other ideas that you might have on how to improve housing security, particularly in the Christchurch context, because I think we need the issues that you have are much more acute than maybe elsewhere in the country. Um, but the most critical thing this over this um, winter has been strongly campaigning on uh, um, home insulation and improving the quality of homes. So for many years now, following on from Jeanette for Simons, we've been strongly promoting a warrant of fitness that assesses homes for their safety. You know, we have toasters that have greater regulation for safety than we do homes in this country. Um, and not just, not just the insulation either, you know, the, the envelope of the building. We don't have to provide, no, a landlord doesn't have to provide running hot water in, the, in a house for it to be rentable because it always just comes down to the price that they're going to rent at. So you know, there's some real basics that we can put in legislation to say that if you're going to be in the business of, of renting a home, then you have to meet a certain standard, a certain standard <coughs> of safety so that the house is warm and dry and livable and safe for the families who live in there. How could you argue with that? Unfortunately, government does argue with that, as you would have heard, um, and so they've talked about a kind of warrant of fitness, but they won't commit. But I think, between us all, we can put enough pressure on them to get them to move a little further than they're wanting to go. I think they'll be really important here, um, as well as elsewhere in the country. In May last year, we were, um, I was here to launch our warm-up um, New Zealand alongside our warm-up Christchurch policy. I don't know if anybody's, how many of you have heard, heard of that policy? Okay, cool, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> it was very exciting at the time. Um, I drove, actually, at the time that we launched the policy here in Christchurch, uh, I got snowed in in Dunedin, which I thought was quite funny, and had to drive up because I couldn't get here otherwise. So we have re-announced our commitment to the full warm-up New Zealand home insulation scheme, the $300 million scheme over a number of years. And ring fence, 60 million of that for Christchurch. So uh, that 60 million is separated into two, into three um, separate areas. That's designed to make sure uh, that Christchurch has the highest quality um, homes that can be provided. I mean, James is right. In Christchurch right now, we have the opportunity to showcase the city as in all sorts of amazing, sustainable um, and secure ways. And one of the best ways of doing that is in our housing. Like the best, um, the best examples of what high quality, affordable, warm, dry housing can look like in New Zealand, designed for New Zealand conditions for New Zealand families. So part of that $60 million fund, um, $35 million is, is spring fenced for, in the Warm Up New Zealand fund, so available to anyone for um, insulating their home with a clean heating device. Two million of it was set aside for uh, a, a Build Back Smarter support service so that families who were looking at rebuilding in some form had access to a service to provide them with all the information they needed to be able to do the best possible build with the resources that they've got and one place to go, one stop shop that had all of that information. Uh, and another fund, again, of around about $30 million so that it was available to those who are rebuilding but for whom the insurance will not include uh, insulation. Because a lot of you will be, and a lot of people that you know will be wanting to rebuild back, but the insurance will only build to the, to the state of the house as it was. 
And so if you don't have insulation, you can't get the insurance money to go so far as to provide insulation as well, which is just doesn't make any sense. Not in this country, it doesn't make any sense. Not in Canterbury where it snows all the time. It doesn't make any sense. It gets very cold here. Even I say that and I come from Dunedin. So, you know, I know how bad it can be. So a fund that would be available to those who were rebuilding for wall insulation, um, ceiling and floor as well, where the insurance couldn't cover it. Because it seems it seems like a wasted opportunity to make sure you know, a little bit of money invested now will build New Zealand homes in Christchurch, Christchurch homes, for the next 20, 30, 40 years that are um, amazing, warm, dry, um, more energy efficient, more environmentally sound in terms of the way that they're built, and better uh, for you and for your families and for the families who take them on after you. Um, you know, we know our homes last a long time, and we can build them for generations to come. So part of our vision for Christchurch is not only making our sure that the economy is working here, that we have sustainable transport in Christchurch, that the vision for what the city looks like and will become is your vision for the city, not some people sitting in Wellington, but to make sure the resources are available to you to do that. And I guess we're here um, in the next part of this session. It'd be great to talk with you more and hear more about what you think we can do to help provide um, that support to you. Um, in the meantime, we'll keep promoting and supporting these kinds of policies around housing, around the economy, around transport, around restoring local democracy in the best way that we can in, in Parliament um, and working with you to improve that. So thank you very much. Kia ora.